Welcome once again to High Desert Radio, the voice of the Jewish Federation of New Mexico. And now your host for this episode, Jewish Federation of New Mexico past president, Sabra Minkus. Uh, hello, everybody who's tuned in to our podcast. I'm going to be talking with Robert Baer, the author of two New York Times bestsellers, Sleeping with the Devil, about the Saudi royal family and its relationship with the United States, and See No Evil, which recounts Bear's years as a top CIA operative, which earned George Clooney an Oscar for his portrayal of Bear. Bear writes regularly for thetimes.com and has contributed to Vanity Fair, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He is considered one of the world's foremost authorities on the Middle East. Bob is also frequently seen commenting on terrorist activities, and he will be our featured speaker for our year at the Jewish Federation of New Mexico on January 19th in Santa Fe. Bob Bear, welcome to High Desert Radio. You know, it's a, it's a complete delight for me, and thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, let's go to the first question I have for you. As uh, You probably are more aware than most The last few weeks have been sort of a tumultuous time globally. And since you are a specialist in international terrorism, but in the wake of the massacre in Pittsburgh, do you feel our government and the intelligence community is doing enough to address homegrown terrorism? Oh, absolutely not. I think we have been too focused on the Islamic State and Middle East terrorism that, frankly, and this is to my surprise, by the way, it's abated in this country. And what really concerns me, not just the horror of Pittsburgh, but an anti-Semitic attack like that. I mean, if there's one thing we should have learned from World War II is the danger of fascism and anti-Semitism and the fact that this that, that 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 synagogue would even be a target is worrying me about America. I spent a lot of times in countries that were going under politically and were gravitating toward violence, and we cannot be alarmed enough. And this government is not doing enough about right wing terrorism and these groups. And you know, frankly, we need the FBI on this much more than it is currently. Have our previous administrations also not been as aware and alert as they should be, or is this a relatively new uh, circumstance? Well, it's new because we're, we're now getting into a world driven by conspiracy theories. I mean, these attacks on George Soros, of course, have absolutely no basis in fact or accusing Soros of cooperating with the Nazis, or that what he's doing in Hungary is in any way subversive, or that he is running a conspiracy, when uh, you know, a good percentage of Americans believe that he is somehow you know, attached to a deep state or the rest of it, that's when it gets dangerous, because a society that believes in conspiracy theories is very easily manipulable. And that's this is this is a new way. And of course, this president is doing nothing because he believes in conspiracy theories. And I I you know attribute you know accusing Obama of being you know born in in Kenya as the same thing. This mentality, which is which of course is just impossible, or this attack on that you know it, it reminds me this reminds me of thirty three. I cannot be too alarmed about this. We can't be too alarmed about this. Well, that's that I think is the concern of the greater community. Do you think that the media has fueled any of this hatred? No, no, I don't believe. I mean, the, 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 the media, there's no media that's fueling anti-Semitism. Uh, I mean, you, you have the, you know, the Nazi publications like the Daily Stormer, and even the you know like the Daily Caller and the rest of them were, yes. are verging on anti-Semitism. It's like racism. It, it's it's a, a microaggression, and it's it's drifting that way. It's not what it is today. And this attack in Pittsburgh, you know, if we if we don't stop it now, it's going to get worse. I guarantee you that. 
Well, that leads right into my next question is, do you fear that we'll see more attacks on Jewish institutions? I think it's almost certain we'll see it, and we're going to see it from the far right rather than Islamic groups. I, I, I think the wind has been taken out of the Islamic State's sails. Uh, I mean, you know, that could change tomorrow, but so far it has been, to my surprise, by the way. And now we are, we are seeing this far right. And it's, it's, you know, the, 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 the victims of it can be from, you know, liberal Democrats to Hillary Clinton to Pizzagate and the rest of it. And the problem is these people are better armed than the right was in Germany in really the 20s. I mean, they didn't have arms. So that this can be taken up a very amorphous group with people with semi-automatic weapons and weapons that believe that there's some sort of conspiracy. How do we stop or how do we combat this? This country needs to start dealing in facts and less in conspiracy theories. For instance, the FBI is not the deep state. It is not running a conspiracy. You couldn't get two FBI agents to agree on where to go to lunch, let alone run a conspiracy. So it's just this nonsense or these attacks on Mueller that have started or the attacks on any number of, you know, and, and if we're, we're talking about attacks on American Jews, it's like accusing Here's one that always gets me is accusing them of being, you know, responsible for the it was, it, you know, for what happened in Iraq in 2003. Yes. I mean, that war it did more damage in security wise to Israel than anyone. And, and this was not this was not an Israeli idea. And I dealt, I deal a lot with the Israelis and they thought it was the stupidest war in the world, letting the Iranians into Syria and Iraq goes back to the 2003 war. So you're seeing, uh, you know, this people dealing in fantasies in this country, in ideology and intuition, which is the scary part. And that's when that is going to bleed out into anti-Semitism, even though, and it, it's something, it, it's, it's something when people are anxious, they accuse the other of being responsible for their problems. When they're anxious and afraid, whether it's African Americans or Jews or or Hispanics or whatever, and it's just general. And this whole uh, this whole white Protestant privilege and anxiety and anger, you, we've got to cut through this. And you know, blaming you know whatever ethnic group for the 2007 meltdown is just flat out wrong. But that's where the drift is going. That makes it very difficult to even how, how we separate the different groups. It's becoming an extremely complicated situation. And also something that's not visual. It's just sort of out there. It's a virtual problem, not a visual problem. Well, what scares me, I frankly, is like ex-colleagues and people with credentials. I mean, you know, real credentials, you know, professional and educational are uh, are starting to believe in conspiracy theories or the government's the um you know is is the is the bad guy or jewish bankers or resident what are you guys what are you talking about we've got to deal in facts and this is what people are not they're dealing in emotions because they're anxious this is germany in the 20s during the depression there are a lot of parallels between germany in the 20s and the United States today. There just are. Well, you once again have segued right into my next question. As a student of history, in particular the rise of Hitler and National Socialism, what would you say to members of the Jewish community in the wake of Pittsburgh who now draw parallels between Trump populism and the conditions that empowered the Nazis? Well, that's the whole thing, is that Trump is a appealing to a populist base. He personally, I doubt, has any particular, you know, beliefs one way or another. But I think he knows when he goes to these rallies, which remind me of the Nuremberg rallies, that he's touched a vein. And then Bill, I, I, I just don't think that he's necessarily anti-Semitic or anything, but he's just, he knows what his base is. And it's, it's sort of gun-toting 
and, you know, frankly, just, you know, Anglo-Saxons who are worried about slipping down the social scale and they're worried about whatever the other is. And it's how you define the other. And then that's what that's the parallel with Germany. Germany, you know, had to look for somebody else. They, they were, by the way, it's the same thing. It was anti-Semitism. And I think what we're missing a lot is Hitler's, you know, sort of immigration and worried about being Germany invaded by others who were going to destroy them. And it was an existential threat. I'm, I'm doing I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading on this and writing on this. So I'm not quite at the end of the you know, looking at the parallels in this right. populist faith. But there's so many parallels that you, you can't ignore them. They need to be looked into and, and combated. Well, I, I mean, you're talking about the immigration. I mean, we're faced with caravans or large groups of people coming in from Central America and from Mexico with now 5,200 troops getting ready to be poised on the border to stop them from coming in. And that leads right into what you 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 commented is that they were afraid of Hitler was afraid of immigrants of people coming in and changing the status quo. You, you know, incidentally, I just had a conversation with a former U.S. senator who's a Democrat, and I said, "Do not underestimate the immigration issue. We have to fix immigration. We have to enforce laws. We have to do all of these things. But take that." issue away from Trump. That's what the Democrats have got to do. So, you know, e-verify, you know, if you want to work in this country, you've got to get, go through a verification. The whole system set up, but, but people benefit from cheap labor. Yes. And you cannot, the, the, we need in this country, tri- you look at Pittsburgh, we need triage. What is going to make people less scared, less anxious? And if it means not admitting you know, 5,000 immigrants from Central America. I would rather save our constitution and the people that live within the borders if you have to give up one or the other. I feel sorry for those people. Those people are not criminals. They're coming here to work. You that you know them, I know them. But I think things are so dire in this country. There are, you know, these multiple, or, or Charlottesville as well. I mean, any notion that neo-Nazis, there could be good people among neo-Nazis, has got to be crushed at every level. You cannot join a neo-Nazi party in any way be considered legitimate. Well, and we have to acknowledge right-wing terrorism as bad as the Islamic State. Yes, I think we do. All right, let's, let's go to Turkey. <laughs> I happened to be in Israel the day the news came out that Jamal Khashoggi had been assassinated. What's your assessment of who was responsible and why? Well, the, there's no doubt in my mind, I'm a student of Saudi Arabia, that the, the person responsible is Mohammed bin Salman. Uh-huh. He's out of touch. He's isolated. What we've missed, and I, I'm trying to get this published in an article, is that there's a tribal warfare among the Shamar tribe. And the justice meted out to Khashoggi was according to that tribal code, primeval it's vicious. I mean, as far as I know, they cut him up alive and they live streamed it back to Mohammed bin Salman. Wow. That's yet to been verified. But and the Middle East is ready to blow up based on this, this Sunni war. And, you know, one side is Turkey and the other side is Saudi Arabia. And then you've got these tribes. And then you've got a young man, 33 years old, who clearly should not be in that job. He arrested a head of state, the Lebanese prime minister, roughed him up. His, his his goons, and why is it okay to arrest a head of state who's you're on official invitation? I don't know when that's ever happened before. I can't cite an example. So the guy is clearly out of his mind, and he's sitting essentially on a third of the oil reserves of the world, if you include the other Gulf states. Right, right. I mean, he could he could he could take the economy down in a day. The world's economy, if you just took that oil off. I, Willie, I don't know. I, I doubt it. But I mean, if he's going to chop somebody up in a NATO country, I pretty well imagine he's going to do anything. Do you think that this is going to have long-term ramifications with relations between Saudi Arabia or and Turkey, or do they even have any relations? Uh, they don't. They're essentially at war. Turkey, the Arabs look at Turkey as being run by the Muslim Brotherhood. 
the Muslim Brotherhood is an existential threat to Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries. You know, I, I can say it's going to get worse, but I don't know that. They may negotiate something. There's talk about removing the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, replacing him with a relative, which would be the best way to, to handle this, is get him out of there. Clearly, his judgment is, is not going to work. And I doubt he's going to get better with age or more money or more power. So, I mean, it's worth, you know, Saudi Arabia. I, I asked people who really know the country, live there and deal with the royal family. And they said, you know, it could, it could go up uh, today or it could go up. It could be 10 years. It might go fine. But we just don't know. I think what we're all missing is that part of the world, all these internal conflicts, which we have nothing to do with. And this, we, in fact, we know very little about them. It's always a danger. Well, that's and, what everything I've, you know, I've can, yeah, read is, is talked about, you know, that the Middle East is, is really made up of a series of tribal groups and clans and that their disputes go back centuries. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I spend my whole life in the Middle East and I'll ask them a question and I'll think I get the answer and I'll say, oh, well, this and that. I said, no, no, you forgot what happened in in. 19, you know, 81 between these two cousins and they'll never reconcile. And then you, then you, then you think you get the whole formula and then you go back and then you go back and then you go back. And, um, it, it just sort of goes on. And these are, these are disputes. I don't think that we can, we just can't know. In fact, I know I used to do American intelligence. We just can't get to the bottom of it. They're too complicated. You'd have to actually be a participant in the dispute to understand what the real stakes are. And that's our problem. And clearly, the Saudi royal family is not going to let us inside into their councils who's doing what to whom. They don't want us there. And there's nobody to tell us what's going on. It's not an intelligence failure. It's just one of those opaque parts of the world. But unfortunately, it's so complicated that we can't ignore it. It, Yes. What about Syria? What what role at this stage should the U.S. play with Syria, and how how are they fitting into this current menage, if you will, of of people and tribal groups and kings? Well, and, <laughs> I think first of all we have to look at Syria as the you know the Russians have eaten our lunch there, and so have the Iranians. Not not them. There's much we could do about it. We couldn't find an alternative. And all of the Sunnis had gravitated to radical, violent, you know, streams that that we we couldn't really deal with. And, you know, and they they don't pay attention to us. The other choice would be to put, you know, 100,000 American troops, which is not doable. We don't have that many troops. Um, You have to look at it from Israel's standpoint, because now you've got a very capable fighting group, Hezbollah, which is, of course, loyal to Iran. Yes. With you know almost a hundred thousand rockets or maybe more on Israel's border. Yes, you can see now, them from Israel the Golan. Inc- <laughs> yeah, his ball is in Lebanon, but they're also fighting in Syria and Iraq, and they understand how to swarm Israeli air defenses. My understanding and it's is doable. That, yeah, I was just because my understanding yeah, is fought, the Iron Dome he, is not equipped to handle the number of rockets that Hezbollah could send from the north. In that that they could send you know five hundred plus rockets at once, and the Iron Dome is not able to uh, intercept that many. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, the, the, in the, I mean, the Israelis are very good at building, you know, air defense and you know defending cities. But if if you simply fire within a couple seconds five hundred rockets, you can't you can't handle them all. I mean, they may develop technology that is now, but someone very smart told me that one of our problems is we make weapons to sell and the Russians make weapons that work and are cheap. Ah. So what, what we're dealing with is, you know, an imbalance and the Russians are getting much better at making weapons. Hmm. Well, that's not good. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, 9-11. 17 years ago, uh, 9-11 gave the rise of ISIS. And we're faced with a difficult question, which I think you have answered very eloquently already. 
and that is, have we come close to winning the war on terrorism? And from your comments, it sounds almost as if we really haven't even begun. (laughs) Well, if you include the far right here in what I expect to happen, we haven't even begun. But I mean, what, what essentially happened with the Islamic State, it was just bombed into oblivion. And I, I generally don't believe that more violence in the Middle East helps. But when you have a group that is so crazy, so psychopathic, so destructive to all sides, you need to blow them into oblivion. Our, you know, I got to be very frank with you. I just thought there'd be more terrorism here simply because those people have been fighting in Syria would be coming back to the United States or to Europe. Um, they tell me that, that I mean, well, clearly this has not happened. We haven't had a, a Paris-like attack or a Brussels-like attack in Europe, which is good. I mean, maybe maybe the spirit has been taken out of them, but Sunni Muslims who are behind this terrorism are clearly a defeated force. I mean, if you look at it from their point of view, they've lost four major capitals, you know, Beirut, Damascus, um, you know, Yemen, Sana'a, yeah. and Baghdad. And there's a historical capital. So they, they are on the losing side, and people who are losing tend to become very violent. Um, now, whether they've been beat into submission, um, let's, let's wait and see. One other question uh, regarding the Middle East before we move on to uh, your series on hunting Hitler. Do you have any theories on what really happened in Benghazi? And why hasn't something been done about it? I was just talking about Benghazi to somebody who knows the military. And look, the, the, the conspiracy theory is that Hillary Clinton didn't allow a rescue mission to save the ambassador. But anybody who's been in the military and the audience will understand that the military cannot send in a, a, a force into a foreign country where there's no air coverage, no ISR, it's called, no reserves, no nothing. You know, it's not like ninjas. Um, and the other thing you really have to understand about Benghazi is the ambassador is the person alone responsible for security. If he tells the State mm-hmm. Department, I can go to Benghazi safely with my security guys and I'll be fine. The State Department has no choice but accept that. If they don't trust the ambassador, they call him home if he's, too, if he's taking too many risks. And it's those facts that, that people are not dealing with. Um, the ambassador made the mistake of going down there. He misjudged the situation. Um, you know, the CIA was there and some of its guys got in a gunfight. Yes. And that's something entirely different. It was unrelated. Um, you know, the State Department security guys, they were it was overwhelming force. The best they could do was just hide. And it was just a very tragic situation. But it was not a political mistake. If you want to say it's a political mistake, it was in intervening in Libya at all, which is that's another question. That's a very big question. And clearly we were deceived that there was going to be an Arab Spring with Jeffersonian democracy at the end of the rainbow. That was craziness. Yes, that uh, I never understood that. <laughs> but um, yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's let's talk about uh, your series on hunting Hitler, which was absolutely fascinating, and I was especially interested in it because I had the opportunity when I was living in Chicago of interviewing a number of Holocaust survivors. And many of them made the comment that Hitler did not die. And then when your series came on, I was mesmerized by it because I didn't know whether it was just fantasy, conspiracy, rumor, whatever you want to call it. But how did you get access to the FBI papers? Well, I know they were released. Let me say, first of all, let let me say, first of all, that when they called me up and they said, do you want to do a program on called hunting Hitler, looking for the evidence that he got to South America? And I said, no, I said, because I know Hitler died in the bunker. And they said, well, why do you know that? And I said, well, my mother, when I was a child in 1962, took me and showed me the bunker where he died. You know, you, there was, there was, it was was cemented over, over. but the, 
in Berlin. Yes, I, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was ten. I was ten years old, so I grew up with the the, the assumption that Hitler died in the bunker, as you know, he even was burned outside the bunker, and so was Eva Braun, and and right. that was it. And they said, well, what if you look at these FBI documents which just released? And what those FBI documents were was an organized search for Adolf Hitler. The United States government, right to the president, the FBI director, Eisenhower, Stalin, and and Churchill himself all wondered whether Hitler had gotten away. And, you know, if you have all of those people... Uh, you know, believing that the Russians weren't certain whether they got whether they got Hitler or not, you have to take that seriously. Yes, and there were that's... thousands of documents tracing Hitler and ending up in a place called Misiones in Argentina. And they said, "All right, here's the conceit of this program: is we're just going to follow the FBI documents. Is there any truth to any of these documents? They were all classified, all very serious. Hoover himself was involved in this." And when you got Eisenhower saying that Hitler may got away, and remember that Eisenhower ordered the, the army to take Birch's Garden, expecting Hitler. He moved divisions to to escape to Birch's Garden. So this isn't this isn't you know the idea of Hitler you know living out his life in Argentina. If you look at it from the National Enquirer's point of view, yeah, it's crazy. But all we did was the conceit is take the official documents and go through them one by one and see if what we were reading had any reality on the ground. You know, Nazi facility here, a a compound in Misiones, and that's been found, that compound. I know. And, you know, people (laughs) laugh at me, well, Hitler, you know, we have his teeth, and we have this, and we have Hugh Trevor Roper. I said, no, wait. All right, we have this compound in Argentina. It's a five-day walk from any civilization. It's a full-on Nazi compound with walls, a, a manor house, barracks. Uh, University of Buenos Aires has been digging there. That compound was made for somebody. We we know that the Nazis were living in the open. So I'm asking people, what, whose compound was that, and why was personal pictures, uh, you know, related to Hitler found in that compound with Mussolini? And then why do we have a manifest from April 21st showing that Hitler's private goods were sent out of Berlin? Now, I realize that he didn't commit suicide till later, but they were planning the escape. I mean, these are based on the documents. And then then we went to, you know, the MI6 and CIA documents, and then we got into the Nuremberg trial. And you have SS officers arrested all independent of each other, all talking about having seen Hitler. And I, and I said, oh, wait, this is, this is the Nuremberg trial. People under arrest, you know, Hohenlucian, he's seen there in Himmler's place. He's seen at Reckland Air Force Base. He's seen in Denmark where there's trees cut down. And we went and we, we checked the trees and they had been cut down for a special airfield. Okay. So what we're doing here, and this is really important before someone runs off and says, this is crazy shit, is we're just looking at the evidence from, (laughs) we're looking at the evidence from 45 to 55. And I defy anybody to look at that evidence, you know, objectively and not come to the conclusion that there was a good chance he got away. Now, I personally believe since we never heard anything about Hitler after 55 and no one's come forward saying he watched him and there's no Argentines, there's nobody that he died in the bunker. But that's a, that's, it's a complicated narrative. But what we looked at in hunting Hitler is evidence from 45 to 55. And, you know, we took this to a lot of FBI agents. I said, would you uh, initiate a manhunt, go to Hoover and say this based on this evidence? They all to a man said, yes. Wow. Well, you found so many things. I mean, that were there. You found artifacts at Misiones. You found eyewitnesses. You found the program in that old hotel and where people said they had actually seen him attending a performance. I mean, there were so many different different things that 
you know, each week as I'd watch, I'd, you know, d- the, I would talk myself out of it the week prior, and then I'd watch the end of the next episode. I think this is this is on on right on target. I mean, it made a logical sense, and also the the variety of exit routes that your people were able to come up with. Uh, yeah, and we don't we don't except we don't go to any Hitler sightings, you know, and say, hey, did you see Hitler? I mean, they did for a while, but I I never liked that part of it. I just wanted to go with the written record. You have an SS officer arrested in Poland who said he saw him. And then, you know, and, and I go back to that Danish forest that was cut down at a Zeppelin base to land planes. Yes. And then from the Tear Garden, you have all the light poles cut down, and we know one pilot left in a small airplane. But they didn't cut down those poles in the Tear Garden, garden for, you know, a random person to leave. It was clearly for Hitler. And then finding what we call the fifth tunnel, which leaves the chancellery and goes all the way where you take an airplane off, where you take an airplane off, leaving from the chan, you know, from the tear garden. And it was a straight shot. And you, you could fly at a low altitude, right over Russian troops. You'd be over them and gone before they could even fire a rifle at you. And you could make it, for instance, to Hohenlusion, where, where he was spotted. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, for me as an ex-CIA officer, I, give me firsthand evidence. Um, the fact that we didn't have a body, that the exfoliation of the skull um, showed it was a woman's and not Adolf Hitler's, as supposedly the Russians had. No, they probably got the wrong, the wrong cranium that was, they did the exfoliation off us. That wasn't his, that piece of evidence in, in Russian archives. And then the, the jaw, which is being held at KGB headquarters in Lubyanka prison, or Lubyanka, I'm sorry, Lubyanka, the Russians, you know, produce on the 9th of May. So Hitler's Hitler's jaw, you know, and they, they, have a, they, they, they have a toast of, of getting Hitler. But we didn't get the DNA. Now, I know that there's a doctor, a dentist at UCLA, who compared notes and said, look, this was Hitler. But again, we're going from 45 to 55, and there should have been a full-on search for Adolf Hitler based on the evidence. Now, the thing they didn't have, 45 to 55, is computers, which we had, so that we could go through all documents, exculpatory, everything, and, and we could come up with the evidence right away. And then we found all the stuff on the ground. So that's the fascination. But I, I think you and I both know Hitler, you know, if, if he had lived to an old age, it's somebody would have come out and written somebody a memoir, would. some, you know, whatever. Right. But, you know, this, this, is, this takes an intellectual exercise for me in intelligence that this was something we totally forgot because of the Cold War. No one cared about Hitler by 46. And it was the easiest thing to do for the government was, all right, he died in the bunker. It's over. Let's, let's get on with the Cold War. Well, how about the facilities that were found in Argentina and I believe in Chile for the manufacturing of deep water? Yeah, I mean, look, they they were they were they, they were they're making atomic bomb. This is not conspiracy. I mean, you could right now can go to Argentina and look at the explosive range where they were making, uh, you know, implosion devices to for an atomic bomb, and they and the scientists they took and the heavy water and everything else and. I said, hey, look, in 1955, when Perón was out, guys, the Argentine Air Force, that area was so hostile, had to bomb it from the air rather than going in and exploding it. And I I think the Germans were setting up, and you see document after document, to restart the war against the United States and set up again and start the Fourth Reich. That's, I was just going to say that. Here's always the possibility is that they put evidence. Out. I mean, I'd be a CIA agent that well, maybe they put out disinformation that Hitler was, alive, Hitler was alive to make it look like he was in hiding and then he was going to lead this. You know, all sorts of possibilities. But where there's no doubt in my mind, looking at the physical evidence, looking at the nuclear facilities near Bariloche, they were, they were going for a bomb and they were going to strike Manhattan just as Al Qaeda did on 9 11. They thought that if they could hit something like Manhattan with an atomic bomb, that it would bring us to our knees and that the Fourth Reich would come back. 
Well, there was a map of Manhattan. I mean, not the found. Fourth Reich could come back, but the, they could start they could the start Fourth the Reich. Fourth Reich. Yes. Yeah. The problem is when you get in, look, you get into a hunting Hitler thing. <laughs> You go, oh, that's conspiracy theory. Nah, nah, nah. But then they, they won't they won't take the time to actually look at the evidence. And if they have a different conclusion, bring it forward. But nobody's brought a different conclusion forward, except maybe no, the they French. No, they haven't. I mean, I think the French came yeah, up with they, they, <laughs> after your series was over. Didn't they come up with something that they had proof? Well, there's a French doctor that came up with some teeth, some pictures of teeth. But I would, I would have felt a lot better if they had gotten the DNA from the jaw, but they, 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 go, they compared the dental records. But again, it's, it's this conceit of looking the case from 45 to 55. And either this was a great disinformation campaign, masterfully run, but any point, you know, any case, the, 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 the government believed he got away. I mean, look, you, when you're in the field, you don't write... I saw Hitler cables, or I think Hitler got away on your own. That just doesn't happen because you get you get put in a straitjacket and sent home. You can only look for somebody like Adolf Hitler when there's an organized search, and in this case, approved by the president of the United States. Which really, which didn't happen, and there were there well, were they people. Didn't because yeah, go ahead. No, they, but they, all they did was they sent out guidance. They sent out guidance to FBI offices and CIA said, "Yeah, look for Hitler." You know, look for we think he went to Spain and there's Nazis. But I mean, it wasn't by then it starts to fade into the Cold War. So you didn't have actually agents on the ground, like going to Missioni's compound and finding out who are these Nazis living there? Which Nazi was so important to have his own compound with a battalion? Who knows what he had up there? It's hard to tell. Well, I think the, the other thing that was impressive to me was how some of the people that were interviewed were obviously afraid to speak. And and did not really, or they didn't want their faces shown. That there would still, well, no, after the all German, these years, the German communities are in in South America, as far as I can tell, are 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 neo fascists of some sort. I mean, at this point, you just say, yeah, well, you know, Eichmann was here, yeah, but I mean, they were Peron, or they were full on fascists, and they didn't think the war was over. And I don't think their descendants were very helpful either. Well, I mean, there's there's places in Chile. I mean, in Chile, when Pinochet was interrogating people, he was using Nazi interrogators with Nazi flags on the walls. This is in the 70s. Oh when I saw this stuff and, and listened to these witnesses, I said, really, in the 70s, they were they were putting the swastika up as they were torturing people and they were using Nazi interrogators. That's incredible. I mean, I just, this is part of history I just completely miss, but I mean, the evidence is there. Well, your, your, your show certainly gave um, at least one listener <laughs> a lot to think about. Right. And I, I loved the, the way you followed up each week with the details and, and the search. I mean, that was very compelling. And I also have found your, your reports that you've done on terrorism. Unfortunately, many times when there have been terrorist acts that have taken place in the Mideast, that you have been objective. And it's been very interesting. And I think that we all have learned a great deal from what you've contributed to us. Yeah, what we have to be now in this, in this day and age is completely objective and call a spade a spade, and and especially on fascism. And I don't know if and our government is ready to do that. That's my fear, one of them. <laughs> well, we, you know, we all, have, we all have to vote, <laughs> and we all have to find representatives and hold their feet to the fire. Yes. I mean, you know, you're a congressman, you say, what are you going to do about Pittsburgh? What stops the next Pittsburgh? And it's not going to be somebody with a sidearm standing at a synagogue. It's going to do nobody any good. And do you really want, in standing in front of synagogue, you know, 20 guys with machine guns? No. That's not the America I know. Nor the one I know. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for being so open and for sharing with us. And we are looking forward to when you come into New Mexico, which I don't know if you've been here before or not, but we have a beautiful state. And you yep, may even be there. able to get some skiing Fe. in in Santa Fe if that's... <laughs> If we get snow this winter. I hope so. I'm, I'm praying too. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, 
let's see, just all right. So let's a couple things. One is I didn't get a clean. You never welcomed him into the program, but you just went right into questions. So I, I thought, suggestion is if you could just say. Bob Bear, welcome to the program. And then Bob can say, thank you for having me. I oh. just need that clean, if you would. Okay, and then, then just one like follow-up to... after after we are not broadcasting, that okay. we're not recording. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Right. While I'm recording, let's get a couple of pickups, if you don't mind saying Yeah, me. okay. Just do that for me, if you would. Bob, welcome to the Jewish Federation of Greater New Mexico's High Cast it's a podcast that we do, and this is in anticipation of your coming into Santa Fe on January 19th to share some of your expertise with us. You know, it's a, it's a complete delight for me, and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, let's get one alternate for me. Sorry, Bob, I just need this for production. Uh, uh, welcome to High Desert Radio. Because that's what we call the show. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Bob, Bob Bear, welcome to High Desert Radio. Bob Bear, welcome to High Desert Radio. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And Thanks for having me. Excellent, I got that, Bob. And then uh, to get a clean uh, uh, closing, uh, you kind of did it, but I just want so I can add it together to make sense out of it. Uh, similar at the end. Uh, Bob, thanks so much for joining us on the program, something like that. Okay. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast, and we look forward to seeing you in Santa Fe in a few months. Thanks for having me. That's it for this edition of High Desert Radio. Thanks so much for listening. High Desert Radio is the voice of the Jewish Federation of New Mexico. Remember, in order for us to continue providing quality programs like High Desert Radio and to continue our work in service to Jewish seniors, Holocaust survivors, low-income families, children, young professionals, Israel, and more, the Jewish Federation of New Mexico relies entirely on the generosity of listeners like you. Make your contribution today to jewishnewmexico.org. Remember, you can subscribe to this series on iTunes and be sure to visit us at jewishnewmexico.org. Till next time, for High Desert Radio, I'm David Wolfe.